Hello and welcome to the Sharpening Report. We have a very exciting episode for you today. We are making this entire episode free for everybody. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to get the whole video. If you're watching on Daily Renegade, you of course get early access. So you're watching this a couple of weeks before anybody else will get it. And that is one of the benefits of signing up at Daily Renegade. Um, if, uh, if you're brand new to us, you don't know if you want to financially support us yet, that's totally fine. You can go to dailyrenegade.com and sign up for a trial. Check out the website, see if you like the content. And if you do, and if you want to support us, uh, then you can do that there as well. And the reason that we usually set it up like that, it's not a big money grab. It's because YouTube has uh, deleted our videos, has even deleted an entire channel, which was eight years of uh, uh, ministry efforts just kind of down the drain. So now we back everything up to the website. But, of course, with storage space and all that, that it costs quite a bit of money. So people who uh, uh, believe in the ministry and want to support what we do, you guys can help out by getting a membership. And again, if you're not sure, just get a trial version and uh, check us out. You get a free week. So, uh, and, um, and even if you don't, a lot of the stuff that we have is available on YouTube uh, anyway. But if you're a member, you do get early access and you do get full videos that we do. Uh, a lot of the content we do, we can't put on um, YouTube because they've deleted it before. For example, anytime we mention the name of the country that is the Holy Land in the Bible, you know, you, that, that sometimes triggers YouTube. So we have to be careful of all that. All right. All that being said, we have a very exciting episode for you today. We are going to be talking all about the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. And this is why we're making this free for everybody because, uh, our, our special guest today is Dr. Ken Johnson. And he and I actually have a, a print version of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. If you're brand new to it, don't worry about it. We're going to explain what this all means. Uh, but we have a print version available uh, that we want to tell you about and kind of explain uh, how this is different than our Gregorian calendar, how uh, this shows up in the Bible. And really, you can use this to um, help explain a lot of the, 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 the kind of strange things in the Bible, like the, the, the day counts in prophecy or uh, the, the flood of Noah and uh, how, how all that works in those five months. So there, there's a lot of things that this can be used for. I found it to be a, a, an valuable tool. Um, and up until just recently, the only version that was available was online. Uh, and there is a free version online, dsscalendar.org, that Dr. Ken Johnson has put together. But we also have uh, kind of come together to make this print version available if you want one on your wall or, or you know anything like that on your desk. There's a bunch of different versions available. And we'll get into all that. But, but before we do, I should probably introduce our guest, Dr. Ken Johnson. How are you doing today, Ken? Doing real well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Really excited, as always, to be talking with you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the show. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, so as, as I've said, people are already interested in the calendar. There's links in the description below. Uh, now, I, I do want to tell people if you do get a calendar, this supports both Ken's and my ministry. So it supports Daily Renegade and BibleFacts.org. So if you like one and not the other, then that's just you know something to consider. But most likely, I imagine the audience probably likes both ministries. Uh, so it does go to help support that. Um, so this is the ancient Dead Sea Scroll calendar. Talk to us kind of about how you put this thing together originally online. Like, how, how did you piece this together? Because I know there's fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, like in the Book of Enoch and things like that, that you've kind of been able to, to piece together and, and figure out. How, how did this whole thing start for you with putting this calendar together? Well, I've been going through the Dead Sea Scrolls for quite a while. And, uh, come to find out their calendar is very important to them. It, it teaches on prophecy and several other things. And it's the basic calendar that we have in the Bible, like Passover is the 14th of Nisan. Question is, when does the year start or when is the first of Nisan? And the modern Jewish calendar goes by a lunar cycle. And so I didn't think much about it at first. I thought, eh, whatever, give or take a week, who cares? Uh, but then it kept being hit more and more. The people that lose use the lunar calendar are the sons of darkness. We are the sons of light. We use the proper calendar. And you see that language all through the New Testament. So I finally decided it's probably pretty important um, to, to examine. It's just like anything else. It may or may not be. One of the things we recently did and are still working on is pulling all of the quotes 
from the Old Testament, from the or from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and kind of rebuilding their Old Testament just to make sure it's the same Old Testament. So that might be a waste of time, but praise the Lord, it's a waste of time. Nothing weird. So same thing with the calendar. I got working on it, and it's really straightforward and easy to use. The only question was. Uh, the the leap year stuff because we have 365 and a quarter days actually 365.2422 I think so we have this intricate system of every so many days we add a leap every four years we add a leap day unless it's a certain thing then we skip it so the lunar calendar you you basically always start with a full moon so it can be up to a month off which is just w very strange. And the complicated part is that uh, system. And so I tried uh, for about a month using Excel spreadsheets, lunar calculations, things like that, uh, twice. I had to take a break from it, and I just couldn't figure it out because, number one, it's too simple. Number two, <laughs> I was using a decimal system. Um, and if I, if I would have done one-seventh to figure out weeks, it would have worked, but I was using point one, you know, one four, what what one, um, and of course it never comes out right. You know, three thirds put together is nine point nine nine nine, and it I'm I'm going through this thing looking like where's the rest of the dates? It, it doesn't match, you know. So anyway, thankfully, about a year year and a half ago, the University of Tel Aviv were were able to use uh, all sorts of different technologies to figure out which pieces went with which scroll and able to piece it back together. You know, and it was really funny because they said that uh, there's this new word that's dropped out of modern Hebrew called a tekufa, and they had to go back and figure out what a tekufa was and because it's in, in the calendar. But it's, it's really amazing. So with their calculations, I was able to figure out how the calendar actually works. And the years are easy because of all the other scrolls. So what I did, as soon as I figured out how it would work, I uh, wrote a PHP program, uh, which is a back end for a website. And what it does is if you go to Dead Sea Scroll or DSSCalendar.org, uh, what it does is it grabs from you the current date and your time zone. So because like right now, uh, I usually broadcast in the evenings around 7 o'clock central. By that time, we're already into the next day in Israel. Mm -hmm. So it, it matches it up to Israeli standard time and then recreates the calendar based on the current date, Gregorian. So it just recreates the calendar on the fly. And it's pretty easy. It's like this year is a leap year, so we have a leap week is how that works. But that's how I got into it, and it turned out to be fairly important for prophecy. Yeah, definitely. And it's amazing, too, that the, the year that you know we started with the, the print calendar is a leap week year, which is a great year to start on because it's something a little unique. And uh, we'll definitely get into that. Um, but you, you mentioned something about the, the lunar calendar. And there on uh, the, the, the modern Jewish calendar, which came from the, the Pharisee calendar uh, back from, you know, you see that in the Gospels and stuff like that, um, which actually the two calendar system is is why there's some discrepancies in, like, say, the Gospel of John and stuff like that. But according to the modern Jewish calendar, we're in the year 58-something. But uh, the Dead Sea calendar says that we're in 5946 a.m., which people can see uh, right, right here, 5946 a.m., which uh, to us would be 2021 to 2022. What's the, what's the significance? of the, the years? How, how is that different between um, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, the, the Pharisee or modern Jewish calendar, and uh, our Gregorian calendar today? Well, real briefly, what happened was uh, our Gregorian calendar dates from the time of Christ when he was born. And if we're off, we might be off, give or take a year or two or whatever, but that's what it's supposed to date from. Um, the Dead Sea Scroll Scroll calendar and the Pharisee calendar both date from the year of creation. So God created Adam. Uh, 130 years he, later, he had Seth, and you can just kind of see this in Genesis 5 and several places in, in Genesis. But what happens is it's accurate, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, but the Pharisees got off, and the story is only recorded in an ancient historical book called the Ancient Seder Olam. The story is that after Messiah came, so several of the Jews rejected Messiah. And the problem is that Daniel chapter 9 points 
from a certain decree, so many days Messiah dies, and it is absolutely perfect. It comes out to be uh, April 6, 32 AD, uh, which if you're using the lunar calendar, doesn't look like it fits, but it does with the proper one. Anyway, so to get away from this, there was this rabbi named Yoshi that said, well, it probably doesn't match that. It's probably from the destruction of the temple to the destruction of the other temple. But now you got a 40-year discrepancy, so he tries to change certain things. And he tries it once, and it just flat doesn't work because it messes up too many other things. He comes up with a second theory, totally different. That still doesn't work too well. So it's totally rejected. But then later on, somewhere along the line, they decide to tweak it a little bit and use Rabbi Yoshi's second theory. And basically what they did is they said... Um, uh, Cyrus, um, Ahasuerus, and Darius, three prominent people in the Persian court, uh, were actually uh, names or titles, and they're actually the same guy. And so they shrink the 200-year um, the, uh, occupation down to 20 years, and then they uh, make a few things a little bit bigger. So the whole thing, when it's all said and done, we're off like 164 years. But that's what happened. And it's interesting that there is, if you look at the Talmud, for instance, and you're, it's talking about dates, it'll always say, go to the Seder Alam, because it's like how we base everything. And the Seder Alam rejects Messiah. Well, the guy that wrote the Seder didn't reject the Messiah. He was very respectful to his elders. But he, he basically said, we all know what happened. We all know what Roshi, Yoshi tried to do because of Messiah. So... So it's really interesting to see that. So we've published that too for you, but that's how the discrepancy got started. And so uh, you can very easily, several different ways, figure out what the year is. You can go back and, and add Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 11, the numbers from Kings, and get up to the time of the destruction of Solomon's temple, which everybody agrees is either uh, 536 or 537 B.C., Everybody agrees on that. So then you can plug it in and know, give or take a year, what this year is. But then the cool thing about it is there's multiple manuscripts that do that, and they all come out with the same date, give or take a couple of years. Uh, but then we have a Dead Sea Scroll that tells us that the Messiah came to die for our sins, and the event occurs in what we call 32 AD. But they say it on their calendar system, so that locks the whole thing in. And again, it's the exact same date again. So it's really interesting to see that. So we know that we are much closer to the year 6,000. So, you know, if the Messiah or the second coming was to be the year 6,000, on the modern Jewish calendar, it'd be about 200 years away. And I think we all agree that I don't think it's going to be another 200 years before Messiah comes. Right. Anyway, right. on this calendar, we are um, 54 or 53 years away. And, of course, there's some talk about him. You know, the rapture, of course, comes before that time. And, and who knows when that would happen. Yeah, absolutely. And like you mentioned, too, it's yeah. uh, really important with prophecy, and especially in terms of ages. Even some church fathers talked about uh, this idea of 6,000 years of human history before the millennial reign, that the whole thing is set up like a, a week. And uh, you can really see that in this calendar. Uh, I want to mention, too, we have um, not only the wall calendar that I held up, but we also have... Uh, poster versions. If people want something a little cheaper and smaller, there's a, a couple different poster versions. We also have desk calendars available uh, as well. We have a couple of these. There's one that actually just fits in a CD case, and there are cards uh, that you can take out and, and use. And then there's uh, an actual uh, desk calendar as well. Uh, and people can check that out at uh, the links in the description below. You can go to dailyrenegade.com or dsscalendar.com, biblefacts.org. Uh, it's, it's, we've really put it all over the place uh, to make it easy for people to find. But the easiest way is if you're watching this on YouTube, just uh, click on the link in the description below. And when you open it up, we have on um, on the top, if people can see that, we have on the top the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, but then on the bottom we actually have our uh, normal Gregorian calendar here. This, If people like this model, this is the square version. It just says square calendar on, on in the store, but this actually has you know pictures for St. Patrick's Day or whatever. But on the top here, this is mainly what I wanted to focus on. When we first start off, we find out 
uh, the beginning of the the beginning of the new year in the Dead Sea Scroll calendar is totally different than how we normally would do it. So they have first uh, a Takufa Nisan, but that's not technically. New Year, the day after the Spring Day of Remembrance, uh, which this year was March 17th, uh, but the, to them it would be Nisan 1 or Abib 1. Uh, can you talk about the difference between like what a Takufa is and how that's different than the first day of the year, even though it's it, it looks like it's the first day of the year, but it's not exactly. Can you, can you explain that? Yeah, sure. Um, the way the calendar works, basically, is it's a 364-day calendar. And people look at that at first and go, well, that's wrong. There's no way that could be. And we're not talking about the tropical year, which, again, is 365.2422 days. And apparently, according to the scrolls, it's been that way even pre-flood, so it hasn't changed. But when we have our 365 five day year we can't have any more because you can't have a part of a day in a calendar so you got to wait till there's at least one extra day and then we add a leap day that's what we do and the thing is though a 365 day calendar it keeps the the spring equinox perfect it's always march 20th so that's good but it messes up the weeks if I was to ask you, when was New Year's this year? Was it a Tuesday, a Wednesday? You'd say, I don't know. We'd have to look it up. It's different every year. So it messes up the Sabbath cycle. And the the most important thing of the calendar, the entire thing is based on a seven-day cycle, six days of work and a day to worship the Lord, a Sabbath. And not that we as Christians have to keep the Jewish Sabbath the way that they did, but the calendar's based on this. And this is why it says that it's important. It's a set-apart day, a set-apart system in Genesis um, so the way it works, though, is if you have a 364-day calendar, that's divisible by 7, 52 times evenly. So you've got exactly 52 weeks, sets of 7. So every New Year's is a Wednesday. It's the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox. And what happens is every year you'll go back one or two days. And as soon as you get more than three days away from the equinox you simply add a week that's that leap week and so now you're over here and you'll sl slowly start going back and that's how they keep the seven day cycle perfect so ours is more accurate if you're if you don't care about a sabbath and you just want the uh, spring equinox but if you need to keep the seven day sabbath cycle proper then that's the way to do it and so uh the way that this works is uh this the this equinox is the key to starting the year so you want the uh, the equinox, but if you started on the equinox, again, next year you'd be like one day behind, and then the next day you'd be two years, two days behind. So it's always different, and you have to have that leap week. But they always start it on Wednesday because they said that's when the calendar started. If you go to Genesis, there's uh, the first day of creation, which was light, and then the second day of creation, third, and then on the fourth day of creation, which is our Wednesday, if we're starting from um, the first day of the week, um, then what you're doing it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that's when the sun and the moon were created. So they said, okay, that's the perfect time to start the calendar when the sun and the moon was created. So from that time forward, we always have that. And each season always ends or always begins rather on a Wednesday. So that's kind of neat to see too. But the thing is though, we see constantly in the scriptures a 360-day calendar or a 360-day year, and that's always been confusing to people, but now we understand it with that, uh, with the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. And the way that works is that there's exactly 12 months of 30 days apiece. It's real simple. There's no extra days or anything. 12 months, 30 days. That's 360 days. Well, outside of the calendar months, there are these, they call them takufa. We would say it's a, it's a spring or a fall equinox and a winter or summer solstice. But the solstices and the equinoxes are, are four points on the calendar, and they're just called takufas. And it's the time for a, a celebration. So the takufas are outside the months. So you've got 360 days in the months. And then just four pointers, the starting of the, the seasons. So that's 364, which is divisible by 52. And that's the way the system works. And it's really, it seems complicated at first, but it's really very, very simple compared to all of our Gregorian stuff. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And usually I am terrible with numbers and math and stuff, and I'm able to understand this fine. So if I can understand it, anybody out there uh, will be able to as well. And um, I, and I love that that we're doing this on a leap week year. So at the very end of this calendar, when people get to the last month, they'll actually see at the bottom uh, the leap week. And that leap week is really important, especially in terms of prophecy. When I was trying to uh, figure out like the day counts from Daniel and then in Revelation, um, it, it talks about these Moedim cycles from festival to festival. A lot of people, a lot of Bible scholars today think that that's a calendar year. And that's not exactly accurate. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a festival cycle. Um, and so what, what that means is half of a, now a full festival cycle would be a calendar year, but half might not be. It depends which festival day we're talking about. And that leap Thing, that, that leap week is so important because if you think about a set of seven years like the tribulation, somewhere in there, there's going to be at least one leap week year, and that could affect the counts. Um, so what, in, in, in my research, uh, the last three and a half years doesn't seem to have a, a leap week in it because all the counts work out perfectly. But the first three and a half years... It seems like there's something there. And we don't have a whole lot of day counts about the first three and a half, but we do have something in terms of the ministry of the two witnesses if they come in the first half of the tribulation. Uh, now, if they do, if they come in the second half, I can't figure out the numbers. They, they don't add up right. Uh, but if they come in the first half, and I believe they do, um, and if they, if their appearance has something to do with um, the the festival of new oil, which we'll talk about in a minute, or the wood offering, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, if you do the day count uh, with the leap week, then it puts them um, it puts them dying and being raised up around Purim, which is interesting because that's a, a, a uh, it's it's not like an Old Testament festival thing. It came later, but it it it's it's a celebration where in Israel they're giving each other gifts. They're out in the street. It's a big it's a big celebration. Well, that's what you see in that prophecy. They give each other gifts at the time of the the you know killing of these two witnesses. That might be a reach. It might not have anything to do with that. But I, I found that to be interesting. That's just one of of many little kind of things that you can pull together with with a calendar like this. So. We, we start off the year with the, the, the Tukuf and Nisan, and then the first day, which is Spring Day of Remembrance. And then we find two weeks later, we have Passover and then the Unleavened Bread uh, week. Now, what's interesting about this is this actually helps explain the whole discrepancy between, you know, when did Jesus die? When did he raise? How do you fit, how do you fit three days in there uh, with, with the resurrection? How, how does this calendar explain that? The way that it works is... Um... The prophecy says three days and three nights. And some people have thought, well, maybe just a part of one would count. Well, even if you have a part of one day and a part of one night, you still got at least two in there. And so if if he dies on Friday and resurrects before Sunday morning, there's not even two full days in there. And so it's always been kind of a discrepancy. The problem is that there are uh, weekly Sabbaths. And that's what everybody's thinking of. That's Friday night and Saturday. Uh, but there's also a high Sabbath. So a low Sabbath is a weekly Sabbath. A high Sabbath is one of the festivals. So when you just say the Sabbath is coming, we need to prepare for you know dinner or whatever. Uh, it could be the normal weekly Friday night dinner, or it could be a holiday coming up. And so it's just like we take weekends off, and we don't work. We work Monday through Friday normally, and you take a weekend off. That's normal every week. But then once in a while, you have Christmas, and you probably get Christmas off too. That might be a Wednesday or Thursday or whenever. So Passover, the preparation day, is is one of the days that it says you shall not work. And so the 14th of Nisan is the preparation for the Passover. It's when you prepare everything and you start the the Passover week, basically. And so understanding that when it says the uh, the Sabbath was coming or the pre preparation day of Passover and it was a Sabbath, it's either Friday or it's whenever the Passover was. And on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, that's always Tuesday's preparation day. And so um, Tuesday night to Wednesday, basically. And so anyway, um, it's either that one of the two and it, no, Friday of course can't work. So the way this works is um, he prepares, he gets things together and he has the meal, which is normally done on the 14th, but on four, the ninth of the 14th. So Tuesday night then, according to our calendar, 
he would be having dinner with his disciples. That's the last part of John. And then he goes out and he's arrested and tried and put on the cross the next day, which is Wednesday. And then he's uh, executed. He dies. They take him down before the high Sabbath starts, which is the 15th, when they couldn't have you know corpses hanging around. So they put him in the tomb, tomb and seal it. And then that starts the uh, three days and three nights. So you've got Wednesday night and Thursday, Thursday night and Friday, Friday night and Saturday. So he can resurrect any time after dusk on Saturday night. And of course, when they went there Sunday morning, the tomb had, had already been opened and he was already gone. So that fits perfectly with what we're told in the New Testament. So it's just not the Friday Sabbath, it's the... Um, the Sabbath associated with Passover. And of course, it's always on a Tuesday. Yeah. And what's amazing too, is in that description after his resurrection, it talks about how, you know, he, he told Mary not to touch him for, you know, and he doesn't, it doesn't really explain why, but when you understand the calendar, cause it says uh, eight days later, then he goes and sees the disciples. They're able to, you know, Thomas is able to touch him and stuff. Well, when you count on this calendar, eight days later, you come to first fruits of barley, which is really interesting. It's also interesting that that falls on a Sunday. Uh, and that, that's something that I didn't piece together. It's just another one of those examples uh, until I was familiar with this calendar, because you, you can literally take Bible passages like that, count the days, and then count them on this calendar and find, you know, if something falls on a feast day or something like that. So what is first fruits of barley? According to um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are four festivals of first fruits. The first one is barley, and that's uh, the Sunday after Passover week. And of course, that's where we have that marked on the calendar. And then exactly 50 days later, there is what we call Pentecost. And we call it Pentecost because Pentecost, penta meaning 50. And we assumed, and we're taught by the Pharisees from the Talmud, that that's the only 50 count, the counting of the Omer. The Dead Sea Scrolls say, well, no, there's 50 days in between the first fruit cycles. So there's first fruits of the barley. And then Pentecost, we call Pentecost, is first fruits of the um, of wheat, and then there's a 50 day count to the first fruits of uh, the new uh, olives, no uh, grapes, and that'd be first fruits of new wine, and then a 50 day count to the olive crop, which is the first fruits of oil, and so uh, and then you've got the the week of the wood offering, and then it starts the high holy days. So they're all together. But each one of these four first fruit festivals are connected with the age of grace in some way, and they all fall on Sunday. What was interesting to me is, you know, there's this age old debate that who changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? We adopted paganism. We're, we're evil. We're horrible. You know, this kind of thing. And um, you see that in different writings in different places. But there's no no reason to assume one way or the other, and there's what wasn't really anything written of Christian wise about we changed it or we didn't change it or there's two of them or whatever. It just kind of is there, and you go back and you see things like in this calendar, you'll see um, like when Jesus gave the the famous message on. Um, uh, Matthew 24 about the end times, 24 and 25 is one sermon. Then at the beginning of chapter 26, it'll say, then he said to his disciples, it's the same exact time. He says in two days or three days, whatever it says, is the Passover. So you go back and you look up in that case, Passover is always on Tuesday, right? Two days before, it's the Sunday service. So it's, we see that Paul always went into the synagogue on the Sabbath to witness, but he always went to church to, to teach his people on Sunday. Jesus always had a teaching service to believers on Sunday, went into the temple on the Sabbath to witness. So you see the same pattern, and I had thought for the longest time Jesus had invented it. And Paul just continued it. But as we see with the scrolls, that's always been the case. There's always been Sunday festivals and Sabbath festivals. And so it's all part of the prophetic plan. So nobody really changed anything. It's just that when we entered the age of grace, we start doing things on, you know, with believers on the believer's date. And so eventually there's not, you know, when the 
the, the empire expanded and there's very few Jews around here to witness to. We're trying to witness to pagans. We go to witness to them. If they happen to be on Sunday or whatever day, that's the day we would witness to them. So it didn't really change anything, and we kind of lost that information. Again, if you know the calendar, the calendar is so simple, you wouldn't have people doing whole sermons to explain it. And so that's why it kind of disappears. Yeah, yeah, and what's what's really interesting is is you mentioned too all these extra festivals because Leviticus gives us about it gives us seven, and uh, but there's a Dead Sea Scroll, the Temple Scroll that gives us twelve. Some people say fourteen, um, and I, I actually have a, a new book coming out later this year called The Lost Prophecies of uh, Qumran, and uh, so people can watch Skywatch TV, uh, def- look for Defender Publishing. It'll be published through that, uh, but um, in, in that I talk about some of these uh, new festivals that you have laid out here in the calendar. And you, you mentioned some of them, like, for example, uh, in, in the second month, there's a, a second Passover, uh, which is for, you know, for pe- and that actually you can find explained, but it's for people who couldn't make the first Passover if they're out, you know, journeying somewhere, if there's some good reason why they couldn't make it, if there's a war or something, they have another another chance. Uh, but you you also mentioned this counting of the Omer, and you see these on the the Saturdays between those four festivals. What 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 is an Omer, and what was what was the counting? Uh, was there an actual like ritual that they would do with this? I believe so. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but on the Jewish uh, concept is they, they want to count to make sure because it that's actually a command. Uh, starting from first fruits of the barley, you're supposed to count each day. And when you get to 50, that would be Pentecost. And it's really important. Uh, we know very little about the, the festival of first fruits of the barley harvest. Um, but we know a lot about Pentecost now from the scrolls. The interesting thing about it is... We, We call it Pentecost because we thought it was the only 50 count. Um, The Jews call it Shavuot, which could be a Sheva is a seven or a a week. So it's the festival of weeks. And that kind of makes sense because there's seven weeks and then the next day is the festival. Um, But that's kind of a a way that the Pharisees hid its true purpose. Um, Shavuot actually can mean Sheva. uh, Sheva can mean seven. It can mean a week. It can also mean an oath. Like if I swear to you that I won't do something or I will do something, that's an oath I'm making to you. And the way the um, the scenes looked at it is Pentecost is the most important of all of the festivals to them. And the reason is because according to their history, uh, it's the time that God makes oaths to men. So God made an oath to Adam. Uh, God made an oath to Noah, the Noahide covenant, as we see in Genesis 9. He made an oath to Abraham, starting that covenant, and he made an oath when he, when uh, the law was given on Mount Sinai. And according to legend, all of these were on a Pentecost. And they were looking for the next Pentecost in the Age of Grace that would start a new covenant with people. And the new covenant is, was, and that's recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 2, on a Pentecost. And when the kingdom comes, there will be another covenant, the covenant of the kingdom, and it will occur on the Pentecost after the second coming. And so they have all this stuff mapped out and everything. But it's the most important to them because they will rededicate themselves on Pentecost. And I think that's fantastic if you think about it, because we go through our ministries and our lives, and maybe we're doing everything the Lord wants us to do, and maybe we're not. Maybe we're sinning, maybe we're not. But at least once a year, we should stop and say, how can I do this next year better? Uh, Lord, guide me into doing or not doing a certain thing. And you can rededicate yourself. And I think that would be a fantastic thing for all of us to do on Pentecost. Now, they would rededicate themselves to the um, uh, Mosaic Law for that covenant, but they're awaiting the new covenant, and we're really excited about it. They talked about it a lot. As a matter of fact, the community rule, most people think of that as a, um, a collection of do's and don'ts. If you're going to become in a scene, it's here's the do's, here's the don'ts, we're done. Well, it's got that in there, but it actually contains the ritual that they do on Pentecost. And it actually contains the history of why they did what they did. Uh, For instance, when the apostasy hit, they said the Holy Spirit told their prophets to move out to a place in the wilderness. And somebody from their order would actually fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah about a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of Messiah. 
and uh, of course that would be John. So all this stuff is in there, and the really cool thing is one of my favorite part of that ritual. It, it really details a lot of dedication and seriousness to the Lord. But one of the pieces, it, it's uh, in the beginning. It says this is for you to recognize sin to recognize righteousness, to start following the Lord, and several things. And one of them is it actually says that they want to welcome our brothers from the age of grace into the kingdom. Wow. And it's just really cool. Whoever wrote this, this particular copy, wrote, writes this, and he knows he's probably not going to live long enough to see the first coming. It's 100, maybe 200 B.C., something like that. But he wants to make sure that we who read this thing know that we're welcome. I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, definitely. And it makes me wonder, you know, it, the timing of all of this coming out has, has been fairly recent. I mean, so, some of this stuff is, is just within the past few years. Um, and it makes me wonder, you know, is, is the reason that because time is getting short, you know, uh, the, the rapture, second coming, all that kind of stuff is going to be happening soon, possibly. And maybe uh, we need this information now and that maybe that's why it's coming out. So that's really exciting uh, to me. Um, after Pentecost, we have Count to New Wine. And that's that's another festival that's talked about, but the 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 you know in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the problem is, um, the the problem is that the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragmented, <laughs> and so we don't get a whole lot of information from what we know. What what is new wine, and and what does it what does it have to do with from the little bit that we can piece together? Uh, it's really neat, and you can understand why they change stuff. Going back just for a second to the uh, the Passover week. Uh, the Pharisees taught that it's the Passover, or the the first fruits of barley, is the Sunday, okay, right after Passover, and the Essenes taught it's the Sunday after Passover week, so it would be one more week. The the Sadducees, on the other hand, taught that it's the day after the preparation day of Passover, so that Wednesday or Thursday. And it's interesting to me because if we if we follow the Sadducee way of doing it. You eliminate and don't talk about the last two, and then you change the date of first fruits, which means you change the date of Pentecost also. All of a sudden, there are no Sunday festivals, and I think that's planned that way. I think it was really interesting because we've got a lot of data now on the Sadducees and where they started and some of the things that they did. Amazing stuff uh, from the scrolls. But with that in mind, we have these, and they talk about these point to the age of grace, and I understand Pentecost definitely would with the rededication. We saw it with the giving of uh, the Holy Spirit, the tongues, and all that kind of stuff. But the interesting thing about it is you go back through the, the Old Testament, and you see traces of all this. For instance, at the very end of uh, Judges, I believe, uh, it's ta it talks about the festival of new wine being in Shiloh and what happened. And uh, there's a lot of things like that. And, and when uh, Nehemiah, at the end of the book of Nehemiah, when they come back, they put all the paganism away and they want to do everything exactly the way Moses did it. So they created uh, rooms in the temple for the festivals of wine, or not wine, but um, uh, barley, wheat, wine, and oil. Mm -hmm. And so you see all these things. They knew about that, but somehow it's been kind of cut out or put away. But the interesting thing about it, the festival of new wine is associated with weddings. And just like a lot of times we have a June wedding, and a, some people say that's paganism, other people say it's just tradition. But um, a lot of people get married in June. It's just the thing to do. And what had happened was, you can see this back in Judges, uh, there's a festival of new wine, and the virgins come out to dance. And then hopefully they get a um, someone to ask them to marry them, and that whole thing starts. And you see that in the book of Judges, and it's kind of a forgotten festival. Um, but it's always on uh, the 3rd of Av. If you, if you go for the counting, it's going to be the 3rd of Av. And what's really cool is, now that we know that, you're reading John chapter 2. Jesus goes to a wedding in Cana. If it's a traditional wedding, there's a really good chance it's on the 3rd of Av. Festival of New Wine. May or may not be, but the majority would have been. Well, it even says the third day. <laughs> yeah, especially if it's an upper type society when you have to do everything proper, you'd wait till Festival of New Wine. So it goes in there. The first couple of verses in John chapter 2 said it was the third day when the wedding occurred. So that tells us it's the third of Av. 
which tells us it's the festival of new wine. And again, a long story short, they run out of wine. Jesus turns the water into wine. That's his first miracle. And it's not just a miracle of, you know, grape juice or wine, and everybody debates on what that might have been, and they forget about why did he even do the miracle to begin with, whatever the miracle was. And it points back to the festival of new wine. So the festival of new wine is talking about two people becoming one. And like a wedding, a man and wife, single, become one uh, couple. And so the teaching on it somewhere along the line is the whole idea of Jews and Gentiles becoming one in Messiah. And you can understand this because if uh, the Festival of Oil, for instance, teaches us on prophecy, that that's very, very important. The Pharisees said that prophecy doesn't happen anymore, so don't worry about it, and, and things like that. So. If you change Pentecost to the giving of the law and the wheat, weeks, and there's nothing about oaths or a new oath, a new covenant coming, and then you get rid of the festival of new wine about the two becoming one and leave the dirty Gentiles alone and forget about prophecy, then everything continues as it is and they retain their authority. But if you look at these things and you think, wait a minute, there's, there's a new covenant coming when Jews and Gentiles are one, that's not going to fit with the Pharisees, and it's got something to do with prophecy. Well, what do the prophets say? That leads you back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are anti-Pharisee. So you could see why they want to like very much quiet that down. And at the same thing, when you say a 364-day calendar, um, that's going to make you start looking in places they don't want you to look. So what's interesting to me is, in the Talmud, there are four things that are forbidden under a curse. If you do these things, you're cursed by the rabbis. Number one, if you read Isaiah 53, well, that makes sense. If you read Daniel chapter 9 and try to figure out when Messiah comes, well, that makes perfect sense because you read that and start thinking he came and he was supposed to start a new age, a new covenant. That means the rabbis are out and we got to start looking for this guy. So, you know. so, and one of the other things was um, reading anything of the current establishment which is Dead Sea Scrolls. And and the last one, which really surprised me at first, is you can't read anything that talks about a 364-day calendar. Wow. That's what surprised me, because I understand the first three would be devastating to them, but who cares what calendar I use? Why would they even care? That, that got me looking at the calendar, say, same thing again. It's like, they don't want me to do that? Why? Let's go do it and find out. <laughs> you know, that's just a normal human response. So it's like, there's got to be something in the calendar that's devastating to them. And once you learn how to work it and see that it works for the Old and the New Testament, and then you see these festivals and realize what they point to, that's the reason why they banned it. Yeah, and we see that all over in the calendar and in and, and these uh, festivals that um, – and the First Fruits Festivals and other, other things that have been uh, obfuscated throughout time. The, the next one on the list is uh, First Fruits of New Oil, which actually is in a week, uh, a full week where – because right after that you have uh, wood offering. So you have a solid week here in uh, – it's it would be our August, September, but to, to them it's Elul. Um so what? Let's start with the first fruits of new oil. I know there's even less that we know about that than new wine, but from what what we know, what's what's uh, first fruits of new oil? Well, again, we have to piece it together. And uh, what one of the things that the uh, temple scroll said is it called the first free first fruits of new oil, the first fruits of virgin oil, uh, which is new oil. But the, you know, um, the thing is, oil is used for food. If, it, if it's the really good quality that tastes good, it's used for food. If it's the yucky quality that doesn't taste good, it's used for lighting oil uh, lamps. And so the question is, what are we talking about here? And in the temple scroll, it mentions the festival because that's when they get the oil in. But the oil that they get is specifically for the lighting of the lamps in the temple, not for food. So it's talking about light and prophecy and these kind of things. And when you realize that and you go back through the New Testament, all the scriptures that talk about uh, Jesus, you're a, li you're a light, you're set on a hill, you shouldn't be hid. Um, Peter talks about uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy, the day star which shall arise in your hearts, and all this associated with light and prophecy. And it's, it's really interesting. I know there's a lot more to it than I know. 
But it's it's just like if we looked at the Seder about the lamb being crucified for our sins, the crown sacrifice, uh, the three gods or the three the Trinity, you know, and all the details in the Seder that point to Messiah, you can look at the ritual and you know what it means. So what we need is the rituals that were done on those festivals, and those have been hidden really, really hard. So we have pieces about them, but nothing about that. When we get those rituals, I'm sure we'll be able to figure it out. It'll be really clear to everybody. But right now we're just piecing it together. So dedication with the Holy Spirit, with Pentecost, new wine is one new man coming together. Uh, we're brothers. We show that by our love, one for the other, but we still stand up by truth. And then the light of prophecy. And I think it's it's interesting because the Pharisees and Sadducees taught that the prophets of old, the gifts stopped. <laughs> they, they don't happen anymore. And the early Christians said, oh, no, they, they continue. And the Essenes said that. The Essenes were known to the people as to uh, being saints, healers with their herbal medicine and everything, and also oh, prophets that were 100% accurate. And so it's interesting to see that you, you can't, a group of people can't fake that. You know, you can look at a person claiming to be a prophet and maybe catch him in a lie, but not a group like that. And everyone knew it. And from the New Testament, we know the gifts continued. So we've got people today that say the gifts have stopped. There's no more prophecy. There's no more this. Not according to the scrolls they, and the, dead, and the uh, church fathers also. So if they're not happening in your church, you're either not looking for them or the Lord's just not doing it at the moment. But it's not that it's not going to happen in the future. Yeah, it's amazing to think about uh, in terms of prophecy, because something else with uh, oil, it points to the two witnesses, because when they're described um, in the Old Testament and the New, it's, it's uh, you know, they're, they're like the lampstands and talks about oil and stuff. What I find interesting, this kind of struck out to me is you have the first fruits of new oil and that's you know definitely has something to do with prophecy maybe the two witnesses and then after that you have wood offering and for each six of these days uh you have two tribes two tribes per day listed out i think two is interesting because two witnesses but also there's an old uh jewish um tradition about the coming of Elijah, and some people think that Elijah might be one of the two witnesses, but that he'll do something with uh, figuring out the tribes again, so, so, something with the tribes and figuring it out. And it's interesting that the day after First Fruits of New Oil, you have this wood offering thing and all of the tribes are listed out. I don't know if it means anything, but uh, that that to me was interesting. And, and we get a little bit of information about the wood offering from things like Josephus, uh, but also in the temple scroll. What what was the wood offering? That I'm not sure, other than the practical aspect of uh, they need wood for sacrifices, they need oil for lamps, uh, they need all you know wheat and barley and all that stuff. And the first fruits, the, what what a first fruit festival is, is basically your crops have, are coming in. And so now I've got all of my wheat, my barley, my oil, my whatever for those crops. And the whole idea is that you're, the Jews are not supposed to partake of this year's crop until they tithe. So they take 10% of the best and give it to the temple. And it's used for food or whatever for the next year. And so that's the whole concept of first fruits, giving your first fruit tithe. Uh, so in this case, on a practical aspect, they need to store up wood for all the sacrifices uh, to be done. And that's part of it, I'm sure, but I'm sure it's got other things to do with wood, sacrifice, the cross. Um, I'm not sure why uh, we have it two by two. Uh, there's lots of speculation on that. But again, at least we have them listed and which two tribes in which days. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to think about and, and read about in some of those ancient sources. Um, yeah, Josephus mentions a little bit about it, which is basically what what you said. It was uh, you know each of those days, two tribes would come and bring bring wood to keep the altar uh, burning for the next year for sacrifices and things. Uh, that brings us to uh, now the fall festivals, which th these these we we've already known quite a bit about from from the Bible and and stuff like that. But in Tishrei, in the month of Tishrei, which is our September slash October, uh, we have uh, first we have a Tekufa Tishrei. Uh, well, uh, this year it'll be September fourteenth, uh, and we talked about Tekufas already. And then the next day is Trumpets or False Day or uh, Fall Day of Remembrance. Excuse me, Trumpets Day of Atonement and 
Tabernacles, and then at the end of Tabernacles, Great Day. So Tishrei is really a, a month full of things to look at. Was there anything apart from what can already be known in Scripture, in the Bible, was there anything uh, with these that jumped out at you from your study into the Dead Sea Scrolls? Any any new information? Or, well, it wouldn't be, it's new to us, but it wouldn't be new. It'd just be it recently uncovered information. But anything from the Dead Sea Scrolls about trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles, or the Great Day, that, that especially jumped out at you? Not really. Uh, about the closest thing is the whole idea that uh, on Yom Kippur, you have the ritual of what we call the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And it points to a uh, Christ and an Antichrist, or a Messiah and an Anti-Messiah. The Anti-Messiah gets destroyed at the end of this, and then the rituals and things that happened, or the mirrors, rather, that happened. And that seems to enter us into the Kingdom Age, which is what the Tabernacles seems to indicate. Jesus talked about many of us will sit under the the um, the sukkah, you know, under the vine, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, and so we're looking forward to that. But the one thing uh, is, um, we call that a scapegoat. It's actually called the Azazel goat, and uh, just that in, in itself and the ritual there uh, tells us a lot. And there's a lot of history about the Nephilim and the Nephilim pre-flood wars and the genetic stuff and everything, a pretty detailed history in the scrolls. And um, this, the, the whole connection with Azazel, uh, the fallen angel, and the scapegoat is pretty interesting. So again, we have a time when eventually all evil is destroyed and the kingdom comes, and we're definitely looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, like I said before, this, this calendar really helps with uh, exploring some possibilities prophetically. I mean, we, we can't know for absolute sure that, you know, when things are going to happen, but it, it does kind of give us a clearer picture. I, I went through like a lot of the day counts and stuff using this calendar. A lot of it fits. I mean, actually, I couldn't find anything that didn't fit in some way or another. Now, there's there's different possibilities. I explored the, the possibility in my upcoming book that um, the Antichrist desecrates the temple possibly on the Day of Atonement. And with this calendar and using the, the day counts that we get uh, in tandem with uh, the Moedim cycles, and it's actually cool that you get you get both things. So you have a day count, which is literal calendar days, but then you get Moedim cycles, which is festival to festival. Uh, but it's one possibility where that event might happen on that day. And there, there's several things like that, which I find really interesting. Um, um, so after Tishrei, we have, uh, you, you know, we have a lot of the other stuff that people are probably uh, already familiar with. There's not a whole lot that happens in the winter months. I mean, we do have like Hanukkah and Purim and, and stuff like that. Uh, but then we finally get to the end, and I just want to, we already did talk about the leap week, but I just want to show people kind of what the last month looks like, because uh, you have an extra week here. Um, now, there was, there was some, you had to kind of figure out how to calculate this, because wasn't there... Uh, wasn't there some challenges to figuring out if it's if it's a full week or if it's like three and a half days or three days here and there? Um, what, wasn't there something with that on, on on how to how to figure that out? Yeah, the the basic ways of doing it, and I, I did this in my calendar book. I, I put down each one of the theories, and for a leap something, you have to either have a leap day or a couple of days, whatever, to get to. Uh, the equinox to start the year over, or you have to have a leap week, and then when you start the leap week is, is somewhat debatable, or you have a leap month. There's really no other ways of doing it. The leap month is associated with the moon cycle, which the scrolls say is um, paganistic. Um, so what we have is uh, the two main theories is like you just add a couple of days or a day at the end of the year, and so um, New Year's would always we start on March 20th, for instance, right on the on the equinox. And that's one way to do it. But if you think about it, that breaks up the seven-day cycle. Mm -hmm. Same thing as, as what we're talking about. And the other thing is, it seemed good, it's logical, and it seemed to be more accurate than everything if you didn't care about the seven-day cycle. But once those were all pieced together, we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, a set of uh, a calendar basically starting from the beginning going five years and then another calendar going six years and a couple of those one of them actually you can see it starting over with the next cycle so that tells us number one that there's no extra days in between the years for the first at least five to six years 
Um, and so that tells us that we're not adding a day or two or whatever every year to get back to the equinox. And so five in a six year cycle, it turns out if you do the leap week, depending on comparing it to Gregorian, whether you either have one or two uh, leap uh, years in that cycle or two or three rather. Anyway, so it's uh, every five to six years you would have this uh, cycle flip and you'd have an extra week. So it's an interesting thing like that. Now, the only debate currently um, is what, how do you, when do you put in that uh, extra week? Some people would say that the, the starting of the year always has to be after the spring equinox. And that would get you up to a week off. Uh, the way I'm doing it, it seems more logical. It's give or take three days with the uh, cycle because uh, Enoch basically talked about the fact that it's, it's the pointer and it's the most important part. So I think getting an entire seven days off either way would not be a good idea. I could be wrong. And if I'm proven wrong, it's really easy to go into the PHP code on the website and tweak two numbers, you know, and get it to shift. So it's a work in progress. I think that's the most logical way of doing it. It's the only thing we're not absolutely sure on, but I think we're pretty sure on it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That And that seems to make sense to me. Um, well, that that's basically the whole calendar. I mean, of course, it, it's it, it's bare bones basics. You you have teachings and books on really all of these, everything that we've talked about today, full in depth uh, materials available if people want uh, to to look more into this. Um, where can people uh, watch your show, get your books, uh, follow you online? Where where can people find out more? Well, we're on YouTube, BibleFacts.org. dot uh, org. That's my website. So if you just go to BibleFacts.org, dot org. Um, and I think you might might be able to see it on the up here in the corner. But um, if uh, you go there, you can go to anything that we go to. So we have uh, currently a YouTube channel. That's our main thing. We're also on Gab for comments. Um, and then we have uh, a channel on like uh, uh, for videos on Gab and on Rumble. We haven't really used them much. We're waiting for everybody to get the live streaming part so we can put it all together. Um, but anyway, if you just go to BibleFacts.org, we have a, a store page with all of the books. I've written 33 books at the moment. And so we're working on other Dead Sea Scroll type studies. And Monday nights, usually we on YouTube, we have a study in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we're going through pulling pieces together, just learning stuff. So it, uh, anybody that wants to can join us. Excellent. And I highly suggest that everybody does. If you've enjoyed the content uh, that you get in this episode today, you're going to love everything that Ken puts out. Also, keep keep watching. Um, uh, I think people are going to be seeing more of you, uh, people from the Skywatch audience. And I'll, I'll just leave it there for now. We'll announce more later as uh, time progresses. But uh, if people out there, if you if you follow me because you see me on Skywatch or whatever, um, be, be looking forward to seeing more from Dr. Ken Johnson. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show today and going through this this amazing calendar and thank you for putting this together i mean you, you've done a phenomenal job I, I don't even know how you do all that computer programming and stuff that to me is like you know learning a different language and i uh, really appreciate you taking the time not only to put that together but to come on the show and kind of explain to all of us uh the, the basics of just how this calendar works well thank you for having me on Absolutely, anytime, and I'm sure we will have you back on again. Uh, so everybody watching, again, this whole episode is, is free. Usually we do a free version and a, um, a, a more in-depth study for dailyrenegade.com so YouTube won't delete it. This one, I don't think there's anything controversial enough that would require YouTube deleting it, but you know, you never know. I've had stuff deleted that I didn't think there was anything wrong in it. But uh, but again, if you want to pick up this calendar, there's several uh, versions of it available. I mean, it's all the same calendar, but there's like desk versions, there's wall uh, poster versions. You, you can just go to the link in the description below. You can go to dsscalendar.org, uh, biblefacts.org, dailyrenegade.com, and uh, proceeds from uh, these calendars do go to both ministries. So you're, you're not only supporting Daily Renegade, you're also uh, supporting uh, Dr. Ken Johnson as well. So that's something that he and I are doing together. And I think that, uh, I, I think you'll find it beneficial if you, if you, 
can't afford a calendar or just don't want it, you can always get the calendar online for free. You do have to go to the website on your phone or on your computer when you want to look stuff up, but just dsscalendar.org, it's totally free, and that is the same exact calendar that's in the print version. The only difference is the print version also has uh, the Gregor our normal Gregorian calendar on the bottom so you can follow along with uh, which day we're currently in. So all that being said, thank you all so much for watching this episode of The Sharpening Report, and until next time. Love you all. Take care. God bless.